Good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to McField Evangelical Church. Uh, I see many people that I know, and I see many people this morning that I don't know. So welcome, everybody. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Richard Turl. I'm the pastor of the church here. I'm part of the leadership team. And uh, I'm going to be leading us through our service this morning. And we've come here to worship the Lord Jesus, and that's what we're going to do by his grace. Uh, speaking of grace, Paul, in Ephesians chapter 1, he talks about what we've experienced as Christians, how we've been forgiven, how we've been redeemed. And he says all of this, the forgiveness of our sins, he says all, all of this is in accordance with, with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Our Father in heaven, the God that we worship, the God who made all things, is a generous and good God, and he lavishes his grace on his children. And he has done. He has lavished his grace on me. And if you're a personal follower of Jesus here this morning. He has lavished his grace upon you. That's how we come this morning. I know that you come with all sorts of things in your mind and on your heart and in your life and in family, because I do too. But we also come as children of a heavenly Father who has lavished his goodness and grace on us. And that's where we're going to begin this morning. We're going to sing a couple of songs that just reflect on God's grace towards us the first one is the classic that you have to sing if you're talking about grace amazing grace it's probably the most famous hymn in the whole world so uh, we're going to sing a couple of songs let's reflect on God's lavish grace towards us
take a seat. Let's pray together. Father, Jesus is my hope and he is my grace and he is my plea as I stand before you, the righteous, holy, pure God, as I stand before you and have sinned grievously and shamefully against you who made me and against my fellow neighbour, whether in this church or outside of this church, Father, my only plea can be Jesus, his forgiveness, his grace, his righteousness to cover me. Father, I thank you that I do not stand before you condemned, but Father, I stand covered in the perfection of Jesus, justified, and dearly loved by you. Father, we thank you that that is true of us. If we have turned from our sins and put our trust in Jesus, we can say, I am forgiven, I am free, because Christ has died for me. And Father, we begin there this morning with your lavish grace. And Father, we ask that we would experience it even more profoundly this morning. And Father, that you would move us all of us, to worship you, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. Just uh, a few little notices from me. First of all, um, someone found this last night um, in the hall, and um, I'm I'm calling for honesty here, (laughs) clearly. (laughs) It's like, how much is that worth? Um, So does anyone know? I'll just leave it on here if it's yours. Please just come and grab it um, at the end. Uh, I'll just leave it there. Uh, Just uh, just to say thank you to everyone who came out to the prayer night last night. It was lovely to do that. Um, I know that's part of the, the, the history of our church, the tradition of our church, occasionally to just come together for a whole night uh, and pray together. Uh, because of the pandemic and everything, I've been here, what, what, three and a half, getting on for four years, and I've not experienced that yet until last night. So it was a real joy to be here, to hear brothers and sisters praying um, together and to pray myself and just join in with all of that. It was a wonderful um, experience, it was a wonderful time of just thanking God. Uh, for his lavish grace towards us, his provision, his protection. It was lovely to hear people's testimonies and stories coming through their prayers, how God has been at work in their lives. Uh, And we spent a good bit of time simply seeking our Father, asking him for wisdom and direction and help and protection and provision. So it was lovely um, to do that. Thank you to everyone who's part of that, whether uh, here or here in spirit. Um, Tonight we've got uh, Mark Housen, our founding pastor, coming out uh, to preach and to lead the service this evening. That's 6.30 here, our evening service. So please do um, come along to that uh, and make the most of that opportunity as we learn together and worship uh, together with Mark. Um, And just a reminder as well, uh, just a very brief reminder, um, that our biannual church weekend away at Sizewell is in November, mid-November. We've mentioned it before, um, Kev has got some little forms that you can fill in to make sure that you get a bed. (laughs) Um, So um, if you'd like to come along to that, and I'd really encourage you to come to it, it's a wonderful time to gather together as a church, a very precious time, get to eat together and just live together for a weekend um, especially perhaps if you're new to the church and you're just starting to get to know people. It's a great way to get to know people. We have some great teaching uh, as well from a friend of mine. So um, just a reminder about that. And Kev um, has got forms and there's forms on the table. Yes, yeah, so please do grab um, one of those. I think that's everything I need to mention. Uh, Penny's going to come and read for us. I'm going to be reading from Numbers chapter 7, verses 1 to 17. When Moses finished setting up the tabernacle, he anointed and consecrated it and all its furnishings. 
He also anointed and consecrated the altar and all its utensils. Then the leaders of Israel, the heads of families who were the tribal leaders in charge of those who were counted, made offerings. They brought as their gifts before the Lord six covered carts and twelve oxen, an ox from every leader and a cart from every two. These were presented before the tabernacle. The Lord said to Moses, Accept these from them, that they may be used in the work of the tent of meeting. Give them to the Levites, as each man's work requires. So Moses took the carts and oxen and gave them to the Levites. He gave two carts and four oxen to the Gershonites, as their work required. And he gave four carts and eight oxen to the Merorites, as their work required. They were all under the direction of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. But Moses did not give any to the Kohathites, because they were to carry on their shoulders the holy things for which they were responsible. When the altar was anointed, the leaders brought their offerings for its dedication and presented them before the altar. For the Lord had said to Moses, each day, one leader is to bring his offering for the dedication of the altar. The one who brought his offering on the first day was Nashon, son of Aminadab of the tribe of Judah. His offering was one silver plate weighing 130 shekels and one silver sprinkling bowl weighing 70 shekels, both according to the sanctuary shekel each filled with the finest flour mixed with olive oil as a grain offering. One gold dish weighing 10 shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, and one male lamb a year old for a burnt offering, one male goat for a sin offering, and two oxen, five rams, five male goats, and five male lambs a year old to be sacrificed as a fellowship offering. This was the offering of Nashon, son of Aminadab. Thanks, Penny. Well, that has to be, uh, whether you're familiar with the Bible, very familiar with the Bible, or not familiar with the Bible, it has to be one of the most foreign to us kind of Bible passages, doesn't it? It's just full of words that uh, where where are we, what's going on, Uh, I guess that's how it will feel for many and we're going to take a look at it um, a little bit later on. But let's uh, start uh, by praying uh, together, we've got lots of things to pray about this morning, so let's pray. Father in heaven, I do thank you for your grace towards us that lavish grace that unmeasured vast and free grace that grace that's free to us but cost you dearly the death of your own son the price paid through his blood father we thank you that you have showered us with your grace you are the god of grace and you're the god of sovereign grace father you rescue us Not because we're nice or good or moral or British, but because of your sheer love and grace towards us, which we cannot earn, which we have not earned. But Father, you have treated us not as our sins deserve. (coughs) Father, you've not treated us according to some goodness or righteousness in us, but Father, you have seen our sins and yet treated us with incredible kindness and grace and you have saved us through your son father we thank you that you are a god of grace and as we pray we approach a throne of grace so give us boldness and confidence as we pray to you day by day that we come before you through your grace through your son and father we do thank you for your son jesus father we thank you that he is our big brother that we're part of your family and that you have made him our older brother. And Father, I thank you that Jesus is unashamed 
to call us brothers and sisters. Father, there are many reasons why there is shame. We have sinned grievously and shamefully against you and against our neighbour in thought, in word, in our actions, in our attitudes. But Father, we thank you that through Jesus our sins are forgiven and he is unashamed of us. Father, that he does not look on us with contempt or disdain, but with compassion and kindness and mercy and love. Father, we thank you for our older brother, King Jesus. Father, would you help us to love him, to know him, to adore him, to worship him, to obey him. Father, we thank you for last night and that opportunity to just reflect on your love and faithfulness towards us as a church over time, through generations. Father, that for over a hundred years there has been a Christian witness in this place. Father, for all the people who have come to know the Lord Jesus here and to grow in the Lord Jesus here. Father, we thank you for that. Father, we thank you that your love endures forever to your people and that we are secure in that love. And Father, we thank you that you are so faithful to us even when we are so unfaithful to you. Father, thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Father, we pray that we would rest in your faithfulness and trust you for the future, for your provision, for your help, for your wisdom, for your direction. Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters at Great Blaken and Baptist Church. Father, we thank you for the work that they do there, for the love that they have for you and for each other, and for the lost, those who don't know Jesus yet. And Father, we pray that you would bless the work that they do, Father, that you'd give them encouragement, even this morning, as they meet together. And Father, that they would have the joy of seeing people come to know the Lord Jesus personally. Father, we pray that you would lift them up and encourage them at this time. And Father, we want to lift before you our mission partners, Immer and Grace. Father, we don't quite know what's going on in their lives at the moment. We've lost communication. But Father, we know that where they live, there is terrible unrest and violence and danger. And so, Father, we do pray that you would protect them, that you would protect their children, and you would protect those in their care. Father, we pray that you'd provide for them with food and water and electricity and in time communications so that we can know what's going on. Father, we pray you protect them from all evil, harm and danger. And Father, we pray through this time of great fear, we pray, Father, that those in their care would see their faith in Jesus in action. And Father, that many of them would come to know Jesus through this scary time. Father, we pray that the unrest and violence would peter out even in the next few days, Father, would just come to an end. And Father, we pray that in that area of India, your gospel would prevail and people would come to know the true and lasting and ultimate peace which only you can give through your Son, the Prince of Peace. Father, we thank you that we can meet together like this this morning and we want to pray that you would come and speak to us this morning. We want to hear from you, Father. We don't want to hear the words of men, the words of people, the words of something other than what you want us to hear. So we pray, Father, that you speak to us in your word, the Bible, by your spirit, in our hearts and minds and lives. Father, we pray that you'd prepare the ground of our hearts to hear your word. And we pray for the children and young people with us today, whether they'll be gathering with us and listening in here, or whether in Sunday school or creche. Father, would you help all those who are teaching them, give them great wisdom week by week to unfold your word to them. And Father, we pray that they would see Jesus and that they would come to know him personally. For we ask in Jesus' name.
Amen. Well, it's time for the kids to go to their groups now. Um, so uh, who's Gareth? You're on Sunday school, aren't you? Gareth's on Sunday school. And my wife is on crash. Catherine's on crash. She's there. Oh, is it this week? It is, isn't it? Uh, that's right, isn't it? Mm. Sorry, should have said. <laughs> Friends on Friday is this Friday. Is that right? Have I got that right? Yes. So Friends on Friday is here uh, from 10 till 1 on Friday. And it is a coffee and cake drop-in thing where you can come and chat, you can come and play board games, you can come and play a bit of ping pong. Um, it's just a, a drop-in opportunity for people to come and meet old friends and make new friends. Uh, and people from church are here and people from the local community come along uh, as well. It's an opportunity for us to connect with our local community. So um, if you are free, and as Marion reminds me, there is a soup lunch served around lunchtime. So um, come for lunch. Uh, that's what I do. But, uh, but it's a great uh, opportunity to, to meet uh, together and with, with other folks in the community. Please, uh, if you're free, come along. Uh, don't have to come for three hours. You can just drop in. Um, but it's a good opportunity. Let's um, turn back to Numbers chapter 7. And um, if I could have the old PowerPoint up, that would be great. This is Mrs. Bernstein, or Bernstein, depending on how you pronounce it. And I, I'd like to introduce you to her a little bit uh, this morning. Uh, she uh, was an ordinary, quiet, uh, softly spoken Jewish lady who lived with her sister Muriel. So uh, Mrs. Bernstein is uh, on the right there, and I believe on the left is uh, her sister Muriel. And that picture would have been taken uh, quite a wee while uh, ago. But just uh, hold on to Mrs. Bernstein. We'll, we'll come back to her later. Um, but where are we <laughs> and what's going on? Um, uh, some of you are new to us this morning. You've come uh, in the middle of a, a series that we've got on the Old Testament book of Numbers. Now, um, as the title probably gives the game away, Numbers is not the most popular book of the Bible. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of one that people tend to gloss over. It's often uh, neglected. Uh, and for those of us who have been tracking along week by week, listening, um, even then, you still can come away, I don't know if this is you, with a sense of bewilderment. What is going on here? What's happening? All these lists of numbers and names and, and so on. Uh, what, what's going on? Where are we up to? What we're going to do this morning is... Uh, we're going to um, do a little bit of catch up and just remember where we've been so far. A little bit of context because I think especially today, then once we've understood where we've come from, the last sort of six chapters or so, that's really going to help us understand much more clearly what is going on in Numbers chapter 7, which is one of the most neglected chapters of the Bible. Um, and we'll see how it very practically applies to us today. But uh, two things this morning, uh, and this is by way of context. The first thing, you've received God's grace. That's the story of Numbers chapters 1 to 6, isn't it? You've received God's grace. God's people then had received God's grace. Right back at the beginning, Numbers chapter 1, verse 1, we're reminded that these people that we're learning about had been in Egypt. They'd been stuck in Egypt. They'd been enslaved and oppressed in Egypt. And God, by his grace and goodness, had rescued them out of Egypt. It's a massive big deal in the Old Testament, this, this rescue of God when he brings his people out of enslavement, out of Egypt, and he brings them through the Red Sea and he rescues them from their enemies. So that had happened to them and it was a gift of God's grace that he'd rescued them out of Egypt. And you may remember right back to week one, we said, okay, what does that mean for us? Well, the question is, have you come out of Egypt. What does Rich mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is they had experienced the great salvation event of the Old Testament, God's great rescue. And the question for you is, have you experienced 
God's greatest rescue, God's greater rescue, the rescue that he brought about in Jesus, that Jesus lived, that he died, and that he rose again for you. So I'm not asking, I'm not asking, do you know the facts of Christmas and Easter? That's good. Let's start there. Uh, do you know that Jesus was born and that he lived on earth and he died on the cross and he rose again? I'm not asking that. I'm asking, do you know that he did that for you personally? That Jesus died so that your sins could be forgiven. That Jesus rose again so that you can have life forever you see if you're a christian here today you have received god's grace he's rescued you through his son jesus but let me ask that let me put that question to you this morning i don't know i don't know what's going on in your heart in your mind today have you received that have you experienced god's greatest rescue ever for yourself do you realize that jesus died for you They'd received God's grace. That was one way. It was one, but there are there are many other ways as well. That word grace is a bit funny, isn't it? It's a bit of a Christian jargon word. What does that What does that actually mean, Rich? That word uh, grace. Well, really, the word grace is to do with God's undeserved favor that He's treated as not uh, as we deserve because of our sins or our, our imperfections, our our failings. But no, He's actually treated as with undeserved favor. Uh, uh, like a gift that he's given us it's it's that language uh, in the bible uh, if we could have the next slide it's that language of a, a gift uh, that's the idea of grace sometimes christians use the acronym don't they to describe grace uh, track with me and um, god's riches at christ's expense g r a c e god's riches at christ's expense God's grace is his riches, his gift of salvation and rescue and love and all of that that he has poured on me at the expense of his son, Jesus. Jesus took the rap for me. Jesus died for me. Punishment dealt with, I now receive God's grace, his undeserved favor, his rescue, his forgiveness, his lavish grace, as we said, you've received God's grace. And they had. And it's not just that he'd rescued them out of Egypt, is it? No, actually, th then we've seen in these early chapters of Numbers, amazingly, uh, what we've seen is that, that they're put into this camp, aren't they? So all of God's people are there and they're all in tents. Uh, and and they're in the middle is God's tent. It's called the tabernacle. And they're all camped out like this. And what we found as we looked at that is even the way that that camp is arranged is absolutely dripping with God's grace God's presence he's he's living among his people in the middle of them he's among them that is God's grace to them that he would choose to live with these sinful people who are disobedient and get stuff wrong all the time but he chooses to live among them that's his gracious presence but how can he do that how can this wonderful beautiful pure holy righteous good God live among these sinful people well there was his gracious provision wasn't there God provided the priests and they were kind of around God's tent they stood in the way so that people wouldn't come too near because if they came near to this holy God they would die but they also made a way so that the people could be near God. Through atonement, by sacrifice, they made a way so that people could live and dwell with God. That is God's grace. And then there was God's gracious plan, wasn't there? Look, he's included all of these people. He's made them his people. He's taking them. They're on a journey. They're, they're on the move, as, uh, as we saw the, the, the picture, the numbers. They're, they're on the move. That's God's grace as well. He's not just sort of left them, kind of, oh, I've rescued you out of Egypt. Now you sort of get on with it for yourselves. No, he's now taking them to the promised land. And that's all gift. It's all grace. It's something that he is doing for them. They've received God's grace. 
And so have you, as we saw. You see, God has made a way that he can live with you, dwell with you, forgive you, atone for your sins. And he's made a gracious plan for your life. And he's taken you to the promised land. It's grace. And then last week we saw, didn't we, uh, Numbers chapter 6, those words. If you've got a Bible open in front of you, you might want to turn there. But Numbers chapter 6, that uh, quite uh, familiar words in a, in a way. Numbers uh, chapter 6, verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Remember, we saw his gracious face. You remember, we looked at it last week, the emojis. We've all got them on our phones, haven't we? All those different, like hundreds of different faces. What is God's predominant face towards you? Is it the grumpy face? Is it the roll in the eyes face? What is it? And what we discovered is, as a Christian, God's predominant face towards you is the smile of his grace. That he looks on you and he says... You, son or daughter, with you, uh, uh, you are one that I love and with you I am well pleased (laughs) because you're covered in the perfect track record of Jesus. And that is grace. You've received God's grace. So some of you sat here today, you're hearing all of that, you're like, what on earth is this guy talking about? Maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you've not received grace. God's grace, yeah. Maybe you can't say, as the song we sang, I am forgiven. Do you know that this morning for yourself, personally? I am forgiven. I have received God's grace. Many of you, (laughs) see, you are, you have. It's good to remember, isn't it? We are recipients. We're recipients, aren't we? We've received God's grace. Grace, we're uh, beggars that have found the bread. We're uh, the laborer in the field who has just stumbled across all the treasure that was buried there long ago. Uh, We're children who have access to our father's pockets, which are just bulging with sweeties and treasures and all sorts of good things. We've received grace. It's the song, isn't it? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. You've received grace. That's the first thing. And the second thing flows from it. If you've received God's grace, so give to God's work. That's really what Numbers chapter 7, the whole chapter is about this. Give to God's work. Uh, How did these people respond? You see, that's their experience, isn't it? They've been rescued, they've been saved, and God has dealt with them with tremendous grace and kindness. He's arranged even their camp to show them how kind and gracious he is. He has shown them his gracious face. He has loved them and he's taken them to the promised land. How do they respond? How do they respond? Well, they responded to God's grace by giving to God's work. Uh, people writing about this chapter of Numbers, uh, I was reading th- this week, go like, why is this here? Why is this here? Uh, this chapter, this could have been in the previous Bible, but we could have shoved that in Leviticus. The author could have put it over there somewhere. It need to be here. It could be over there. It, it could be sort of spread out. It's a very, as you read the whole of Numbers chapter 7, I challenge you to do that this afternoon. It, it's, it's a very repetitive list, right? Basically, uh, each tribe, uh, there are 12 tribes of God's people and a leader from each tribe comes and they give, they present a gift. And it's exactly the same as we just had in the reading. Every time they bring the same stuff. So it is just an incredibly long and repetitive list. And they sort of say, well, couldn't they have sort of spread that information out a bit? Why does it come here right now? Well, it's all in that one word. And if you take nothing away from this morning, take this. It's the one word, response. Response. It's a response Here, as they give their gifts to God's work, they are responding to God's grace towards them. 
that's the main thing this morning. Forget everything else. One word, respond. Respond. Respond to God's grace by giving to God's work. Uh, Someone uh, puts it like this. Uh, The leaders here as they come, we saw one, didn't we? Nation, verse 12, he comes and he, he brings this gift from the tribe of Judah. They're portrayed, these leaders, as responding to the grace of God shown in the establishment of the tabernacle and the priesthood. Someone has said, this is a thankful response to the gracious sign of God's presence in their midst. Last night, last night we responded to God. We thanked God with our words. But God also calls us to respond to his grace and to thank him with our wallets as well. And that's what we see here. Two uh, very simple observations from uh, number seven. We're just going to observe two things and see how they uh, apply to us. The first is that uh, they gave these gifts, these offerings as they're called, they, they gave them for the work. Did you notice that? Very simple point, but it's there, isn't it? Verse three, uh, they bring these carts and these oxen and they bring them before the tabernacle. They bring them to God's tent. They bring them for the work of the tabernacle. That's the first thing. Uh, but then, then verse 5, God says, speaks to Moses and he says, accept these from them that they may be used, where, what, why? That they may be used in the work at the tent of meeting. Uh, give to the Levites as each man's work requires. Uh, so there were different bits of work that different groups had to do and whatever they needed they were to be given those things and that's what you see uh, on from verse 5. Moses verse 6 hands out the various carts and oxen to the, the different teams if you like. So uh, verse 7 he gave two carts and four oxen to the Gershonites. Why? As their work required it says. Verse 8 uh, the Merorites he gave them four carts, eight oxen as their work required the other guys didn't need it because they just carried stuff on their shoulders so they didn't need the carts or the oxen their work didn't require it but it's all about God's work it's all about the daily running of the tabernacle the, the sacrifices and so on and as the list goes on all you see in there is each tribe bringing the bits and bobs that are needed for the daily running of God's tent the tabernacle the sacrifices and all of that stuff how does that <laughs> apply to us today Well, fast forward to the New Testament. How does this apply to us? Christians are called to respond to God's grace, aren't we? And we're called to, if I can sort of summarize it, willingly, cheerfully, sacrificially, generously, regularly give a generous portion of our total household income, our means, if you like, to God's work. Now, uh, New Testament Christians such as us, where we're called to be generous, we're called to be kind, we're called to be hospitable, we're called to uh, look after the needy. There's just general calls on our lives in those ways. But this is more specific. This is what Paul describes in, say, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, that we willingly, cheerfully, sacrificially, regularly give a generous portion of our total household income to God's work. And that means it's a proportion of of all that we have. That's different for each one of us, isn't it? Some of our households have one salary or two or more or other things coming in or whatever we have, whatever we own, our assets and so on, whatever it looks like for each one. But we're to give a proportion of that to God's work. What do we mean by God's work? (laughs) Another vague Christian sort of jargon phrase, isn't it? God's work, what does that actually mean? Well, what I want to suggest to us this morning is that when we say that we need to give to God's work, first and foremost, that means that we are to give to the local church. Not, not the, sort of the church that's around the corner from you, as it happens, but what I mean by the local church is your church, the church that you belong to, the church that you're a part of. I think the Bible teaches us that first and foremost, our giving should go there. Why? Uh, Let me explain. Um, We all uh, speak in different ways, don't we? And um, say things in our different accents. Sometimes I say things up the front and everyone draws a blank because (laughs) like even Johnny, 
uh, just they don't uh, you know the accent just doesn't communicate so uh, I think what, what's one of the words um, w- wait 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 yeah that just like what's he talking about is he telling me to wait or is he talking about uh, the scales or th- there's all sorts of different ways in which communication go- goes wrong like that I, I had a boss um, who was I have to say Johnny I'm very sorry he was Scottish um, <laughs> And uh, he used to talk, and just occasionally, he would just drop a word. In a sentence, the word wouldn't be there. Like, I don't talk like that. that that's, that's just a word was missing from the sentence. But to him, that was fine, like, because he's Scottish. Yeah, the different rules, basically. Um, <laughs> received pronunciation. I, I can't do that, but... <laughs> yeah, he just, yeah. <laughs> I'm done with you for today, Johnny, but we'll come back next week. Um, <laughs> but, but he just you kind of dropped words. He had a funny way of saying things. My granny had a funny way of, of, of saying things. She, I guess she's from a different generation. She, just certain little quaint little sayings and different ways of saying that she said some words that would not be appropriate to be <laughs> used now in, in different contexts and so on. Uh, but I won't go into that. But, but she, <laughs> she, she, she used to have this little phrase that she used to, to use. She'd say, he belongs the scouts. Richard belongs the scouts. He, 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 you know, she belongs the church. Uh, they belong the, the football team or, or whatever it is. He belongs the scouts. Uh, now, I wouldn't talk like that. You know, at best, I would say I belong to the scouts. Right? There's the missing word, right, for me anyway. I belong to the scouts. But I probably wouldn't even say that, would I? No, I would say something like I'm part of the scouts or I go to scouts, yeah? That makes more sense, doesn't it? I, I'm part of this. But she just had this lovely quaint expression, he belongs to. She belongs to. Uh, not even to, sorry. She belongs, right? She belongs the guides. He belongs the scouts. She, he, they belong the church. And that's how she used to talk. And that's what we need to understand, isn't it? You belong here. You belong here. If you're, if you're part of this church, you belong here. You're part of the family. You're a, a part, a vital part of the body. It's the New Testament language, isn't it? The picture of, of the body with its many parts. You belong here. And you've committed here. Uh, here is your church. Here is where you're fed and led, right? Hopefully, I hope. <laughs> here is where you're fed. And here is where you're led. You've said, I'm going to put myself here under these five under shepherds. Uh, these guys lead me. I, 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 I'm going to put myself under their authority, their care, their responsibility. I'm fed and led here. I belong here. And the New Testament would say, where you belong, that local church that you're a part of, where you belong, where you're fed and led, you give and serve. That's the emphasis uh, of the New Testament. That in a sense, look, I've, I've cashed in all my chips here. I'm throwing everything into what this church is doing and what we're trying to achieve. I'm on board with this mission. You know, I'm, I'm part of this motley crew as we prayed and talked last night. A motley crew that we are. I'm fed and led here, so I give and serve here. This is um, Sir Fred Catherwood on the left there. Uh, there's his, his wife. Uh, Fred uh, Catherwood, I don't know if you, you, you know of him, he's a British politician and uh, writer. He was the president of the Evangelical Alliance uh, for a number of years. He was the uh, president of the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students. He was knighted in 1971. Uh, he was married to Elizabeth there, who was the daughter of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, who was sort of mentioned in the prayer meeting last night as well, a great Welsh a preacher and uh, an author, pastor. Uh, and uh, so Fred there uh, died in, in 2014 at the age of, the wonderful age of 89. Uh, and this is what uh, Fred Catherwood said about uh, exactly this, about giving to our local church. He said, our church has first call. 
the church is central to Christian activity. That's right, isn't it? God has, has put us in churches and the church, therefore, is central to Christian activity. And the church, therefore, uh, calls of us, the, 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 if you like, the first port of call for, for our support. He, he talks about um, a secular individualistic society. It's where we live, isn't it? Uh, in a secular kind of individualistic society, great uh, emphasis placed on the individual. And then he says, well, uh, into all of that, that there are organizations, aren't there? There are groups of people. There's trade unions and political parties and corporations and charities and, uh, and so on. And that's better than, uh, you know, you can achieve a lot more together and all of that. But then he says this, but all those bodies are useful, but the church is not only useful, it is divinely ordained. And he goes on to say, if we are members of the church, we must support it. Uh, Jeremy Walker is a pastor in Crawley. He's written about this and he poses this question. What should be my priority in giving? Okay, assuming I've established I'm a Christian, I ought to give. But what should be my priority in giving? He says, the answer is that first call on your financial investment ought to be the church to which you belong. The church to which you belong. You see, where, where you belong, where you've committed, where you've cashed in all your chips, where you're fed and led, is where you give and serve. Not that you don't give and serve elsewhere and do other things, of course, but that has first call. So, just practically, I'm not one for talking personal illustrations, I'm not going to go into details, but as a family... Uh, we give a portion of our income away, uh, as we're called to do in the New Testament. And uh, of that proportion of our income, the, if you like, the, the, the first and the most, the, the best and the bulk of that comes here. Because this is where we belong. This is our family. Uh, this is the body of which I am a part. Uh, this is where I am fed and led. And so this is where I give and serve. This is where I'm encouraged. This is where I'm challenged. It, sometimes it's, uh, it, it's funny, isn't it? As the guy who stands up here, sometimes I could be seen as, uh, the, oh, he's a pastor. So he's gone to like SAS Bible College, grueling alpine training, uh, all of that stuff. He's done all of that. And then he kind of gets parachuted in to our church. N no, <laughs> this is my church. It's your church too. It's his church. This is my family. This is where I belong. This is where I get challenged. This is where I get encouraged. This is where I get prayed for. This is where I'm fed and led. So this is where I give and serve. Now, while we're on personal, elephant in the room. And I apologize to any of you new to the church. You think, oh, you know, this is one of those churches that's always after your money. We're not. <laughs> uh, I'll, call, I'll explain why we talk about money in a moment. We, we're really not like that at all. Some churches are. That's wrong, wicked. Um, but we're, we're not into that. But we do talk about money because, you know, we all have money and so on. But uh, the elephant in the room, of course, uh, that I will mention, I've mentioned it before. For some of you, it's an elephant. Personally, for me, from my background, it's not an elephant. But uh, depending on your background, what kind of church you come from, it might be an elephant. The elephant in the room, of course, is that the guy at the front's talking about money and the guy at the front receives a salary from the church. Uh, so just to be really clear, when I talk about money, there's no vested interest on my part. Uh, it's not a bid for a raise. Uh, my salary was set on a scale before I even arrived at the church. It remains on that scale. Uh, nothing's changed there and nothing will change there at all. It's not uh, anything like that. And it's not uh, some sort of vested interest from Rich to talk about money. No, I talk about money because the Bible talks about money. And because Jesus talks about money, because Paul talks about money. And because we live our lives all the time handling money, it's such an important subject to talk about, isn't it? We all have to deal with money all of the time. It's part of our lives, and I'm a pastor, so I preach the Bible and we talk about money from time to time. But uh, hey, the big thing, it's a response. Giving to God's work is a response to God's grace. He's been so gracious. That's the way uh, Paul picks up in the New Testament. He says, for you know, look at there, there it is. <laughs> for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, 
You know, the Prince of Glory left the palace of heaven, didn't he, and came down into this broken and sinful and messed up world for us. He became poor so that through his poverty we might become rich, spiritually rich, forgiven, lavished with grace. And in that context, Paul uses this beautiful little phrase, the grace of giving. Just the verse before, I think, the, gr- the grace of giving, giving is a grace. It's a gracious thing and it's a response to God's grace uh, towards us. Jesus says, doesn't it, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So giving to God's work means first and foremost giving to God's work here in your church, if this is your church, if you belong here, if you're fed and led here, then you're called to give and to serve here. That was a massive first point. The second one's uh, much more straightforward and simple. Just simply, chapter 7, all of them were involved. So through the chapter, one after another, each tribe, the 12 tribes of Israel, a leader from each one comes up and brings the gift. They're all involved. It's so repetitive. (laughs) If you want a nap this afternoon. (laughs) But it's so repetitive and it's even more repetitive because they bring the same stuff every time. It's just the same, the same, the same, the same. There's no difference whatsoever. Now, we've just seen, haven't we, that the way we give as Christians is different to that. We have certain means. We all have different means and we give a proportion of our means so it's going to look different for each one of us. But here it's just like the same thing, the same thing, the same thing over and over. What's going on there? What can we learn from that? The thing that we learn is that they gave together Together. They gave as one. Uh, they gave uh, as a whole people. Someone helpfully pointed this out to me this week. You know, these tribes, these 12 tribes, were riven with jealousies and family feuds between them. It's a story of the Old Testament. They're always falling out with each other. But what you see here, which is remarkable, is they respond to God's grace by giving to God's work, and they come together as one, and they all give to the work. Amazing. And we saw this this time last year in the book of Nehemiah. And uh, we were just working our way through Nehemiah about this time last year, I think it was. And we came across this little phrase, very simple phrase. The people came together and they said, we assume the responsibility. We assume the responsibility. Not he assumes the responsibility or she assumes the responsibility or they, those particular people or those particular families or that subset of God's people or or the leaders or anything like that. No, this particular team of people. No, we assume the responsibility. You see, we do as a church, we together assume the responsibility for God's work here. We enable God's work as we give to it. Okay, Rich, where are you going with this? Let me land the plane. Uh, What I want you to do is this. I want you to go home, not now. (laughs) Johnny's gone, he's already home, he's watching TV. But (laughs) um, I want you to go home as a tribe, okay? Now, your tribe might be you. Your tribe might be you too. Or it might be you few. Or maybe there's loads of you, I don't know. But whatever your tribe is, I want you to go home today as your tribe, just like they did. And I I want you to ask this question, the obvious question that we all need to ask. We all need to ask this one. Have I, have we, received God's grace? Have we received God's grace? Now, if the answer to that, now you're going to, if you love flowcharts, who likes a flow chart? Go on, put your hand up. Some of you do. Oh, you get your, your little highlighters out. If you like, you're going to love this, right? The rest of you can hate it. But no, if the answer to that question is no, I don't think I have received God's grace. I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know what God's grace is. I don't get all this stuff. If the answer is no, then please stop there and just keep coming and keep listening and keep learning about Jesus. I forget everything I've said about money for, for now. If the answer is yes, yes, I've received God's grace. Jesus died for me. I've received God's lavish grace. If the answer is yes, then the next question is obvious, isn't it? On the flow chart, right? Have I started giving to God's work here? 
because that's part of the response. Have I started giving to God's work here? If the answer is no, please start. If you've received God's grace, you give to God's work. If the answer is yes, then maybe the next question could be, well, how will I continue to give to God's work here? What will that look like? Do we need to review? I'd encourage everyone to review their giving. It's well, once a year or whatever. Things change, don't they? Things move around. Review. What are we doing with that? How are we going with that? But just follow that flow chart through. That's tribes. A word to teenagers. Teens. <laughs> And wherever you are, and you might be watching online, I don't know, but you sat amongst as well. But teenagers, what I would say to you is, for starters, that flowchart's really helpful, okay? You, you do that for yourself, right? Forget mum and dad or whoever, but just, just do that for yourself. Have I received God's grace? If the answer's no, then keep coming along, keep hearing, keep listening, keep asking your questions, keep finding out more. And we pray that you come to know that grace one day. If the answer is yes, I've received God's grace. Jesus died for me. I, he loves me. He saved me from my sins. If, if the answer is yes, then I would encourage you to go to the next question. Have I started giving to God's work here as a teenager? Uh, the reason I say that is one of the most helpful things that a pastor ever did uh, with me was sat me down as a youngster. I believed in Jesus. I trusted in Jesus. I, I loved him. And I knew that this whole thing here, like the local church, uh, reaching out to the lost and all of that, is the most important thing in the world. It is the most important thing. And, and I realized that. And he said, okay, well, if that's the case, then you need to start giving to that work. And it was obvious. It was logical. It was sensible. Of course I would. This is the most important thing. And so by God's grace, I started as a teenager. What was it? Pocket money and gardening jobs. Just a bit. Just a proportion of that. It was tiny. But God got me started then. And if you're there, if you've received God's grace, just get started now. Get used to it. It's part of your response to his grace towards you. Mrs. Bernstein. Oh, we've forgotten about her, haven't we? Where's she gone? There she is. Mrs. Bernstein or Mrs. Bernstein. Uh, let me tell you a little more about her. Uh, she was a quiet, softly spoken uh, Jewish lady who lived with her sister Muriel. And they lived in Chroma. So there we are, over the border, but not too far away. Uh, and Muriel, uh, over time, became ill, and she was cared for by the staff of the, the old hospital uh, up there uh, in Cromer. And when Mrs. Bernstein, or Mrs. Bernstein, died, she left in her will £11.4 million <laughs> to Cromer Hospital. Uh, that was in 2000. And it was her way of, I guess, saying thank you. You know, she, she responded to what she'd received. In, in her case, it was what her sister had received uh, by giving to that work. And she gave £11.4 million to Cromer Hospital. And it is no exaggeration to say that that hospital is there now because of her. No exaggeration at all. I know that from what I've seen online, but uh, someone spoke to Catherine. She works up that way. And she said, look, you know about this lady. If it wasn't for her, that hospital would not be there. She responded to all that she'd been given, all her sister had been given. And there's a, a Muriel Toms procedure um, unit up there named after uh, her sister and, and so on. Now, you're not, uh, uh, when you last checked, a softly spoken, quiet Jewish lady living in Cromer, as far as I'm aware. I don't know, maybe, sorry if that is you, uh, offended you, but I, I guess for most of us, we're not uh, there. You don't have 11.4 million pounds just sat there waiting for that moment. Uh, you don't have 11,000 pounds sat there waiting, or even 1,100, or even, dare I say, 11 pounds sat waiting for that moment. But... We are in the business, are we not, of saving lives. Now that's what she put that into. It's a hospital. They save lives. They care for people, don't they? We are in the business of saving lives. In, in a sense, we're a hospital, right? 
we, we, we bring people in and we introduce them to the greatest doctor ever, the Lord Jesus, who can heal our greatest sicknesses. We're in the business of saving lives. We're a hospital, or you could say we're a lifeboat. And that's God's work here. And it has a claim on our incomes. On each one of us. On each household. Because he does. He has a claim on all of us. And all that we have. Now I said just a moment ago, didn't I, uh, that I um, have no vested interest in, in what I'm saying here. And in the sense that I said it then, that's absolutely true. But it's not fully true, is it? Of course I have a vested interest in saying this. Because God is calling us as a church to move forward. And part, just part, of how we do that is when we respond to God's grace by giving to God's work. <coughs> Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we are recipients. We are children. We have received from you. Father, help us to respond in worship, in thanksgiving, in praise. Father, help us to respond with all that we are ourselves and all that we have, our stuff. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's respond to his grace. We're going to do that now. We're going to sing a couple of songs which just help us to look again and see God's grace for us and then begin to respond in worship and praise and with our whole lives to what he's done for us.
Let's pray. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Father, your love for us is incredible, more than amazing, outstanding, overwhelming, beyond our comprehension, Father. Father, would you help us to respond with thankful hearts? And would you help us to give of ourselves, of our lives, of our stuff, of all that we are and all that we have, for your eternal glory we pray. Amen. Thank you.